these, these opportunities will appear to you, and that is a, an exciting thing about what it is we do. Fourth, uh, a fourth tip. This, uh, the first three are kind of, I guess, more, uh, since we're lawyers here, procedural rather than substantive. Pick a community. Um, be realistic about salary and expenses. Recognize that you'll have serial careers and build that. Uh, but I'm going to make two now that are more, maybe more substantive about kinds of things to focus on. Um, and so the fourth tip is this. I think there's still an incredible need in this society for people who want to be about racial reconciliation. Um, I, I just see that so powerfully today. We're, we're right now, and I would encourage you to do that in your own way, whether you know at your at your firm, in your civic organizations, in your neighborhoods. I would encourage you to do that. Um, we're celebrating right now, celebrating for some, commemorating for others. 400 years of Virginia, Jamestown was established in. May of 1607. It's a great celebration for the, because it was the expansion of English-speaking civilization to the New World. It was um, the birthplace of, the, of elected legislative bodies in the New World. It was uh, the, the, the first place, really, on this continent where there was the interchange between native Virginian, European, and African cultures on Jamestown Island. Um, the values that those settlers at Jamestown brought grew into notions of the equality of all people and Declaration of Independence and freedom of religious worship and the Virginia Statute of Religious Freedom. And much has happened in those 400 years, and so it's a celebratory year for some. But for native Virginians, it's not exactly a celebration. The, the early history and even to today, history today is painful for African Americans who came first to Jamestown in the New World in 1619. Uh, as Martin Luther King used to say, we were here before the pilgrims landed at Plymouth Rock. African Americans were in Virginia before Plymouth Rock in 1620. It's not a uh, celebration. Again, there's a lot of pain along the way. But even today, there's need, there's great need for, uh, for people who are about racial rec reconciliation, broadly defined. I am the governor now dealing with the legislature and a tough legislative body. I've had to witness on the floor a very divisive and kind of unusual debate this year among legislators about whether Virginia should officially express any sense of remorse or apology for slavery. I can't believe that it, it's that hard, really. But it was very hard for some legislators to do that. Virginia wasn't an innocent bystander when it came to slavery. No, Virginia enshrined and perpetuated and venerated and defended through drops of blood an institution. And to say that Virginia regrets that, wish it had never happened, apologizes to those who, whose current lives are still affected by that legacy seems straightforward. But the fact that it was hard to do for some in the legislature tells me that there's still a real need for people who can work to build bridges. This year in the legislature, about 50 bills got introduced that to varying degrees are bills that are punitive towards new Americans. Now, immigration policy is an important thing to get right, and there are important things that you have to do to make the immigration policies right. But so many of the bills that I see that get introduced, I think really go beyond trying to strike the right balance in immigration policy and instead try to take advantage or exploit xenophobic feelings about people whose skin colors are different, whose accents sound funny, who speak a different language, who wear apparel that is unusual, and I see that in our politics, and I see that in our communities today. You know, if Pocahontas hadn't saved John Smith's life twice, we might not be here. So one of the original Virginia values is welcome to outsiders. And if we go down a path, whether it's in policy or just in the way we treat people in this area of immigration, of pushing away new Americans, we will have sold out something that was very, very basic about the original Jamestown experience. And so what we need in our communities, and this is a public service you can provide in your workplace and in your church and in your neighborhood and in your school, we need people who are bridge builders, who are going to work to to continue to, to make more perfect, in that great phrase out of the Constitution, to make more perfect our fidelity to the ideals of equality. It is a powerful thing when you think about it that Jamestown was the place where native Virginians and the European and African cultures all mixed together for the first time 
in the, uh, in the soil of this hemisphere. That's a powerful thing. And you can almost look at the story of our nation as a story of that very experiment. Then with, uh, with folks from Asia and other nations as well mixing in, that's really been the story of our country. But there's a tremendous amount of work to do. And lawyers are uniquely situated by training to do it, to be bridge builders and try to build bridges across racial lines, build bridges across ethnic lines. And I'll say one more thing about this before I go to my last tip, is that not only should you do this because it's the right thing to do, we should be bridge builders and focused on reconciliation because our future really depends on it. We are in a global world right now where nations around, we're not competing in Virginia against Charlotte and Baltimore anymore. We're not competing against Los Angeles and Boston anymore. We're competing against Singapore and, and Mumbai and, and, uh, and Hong Kong. We're competing with regions and nations around the world. And the competition is at base a competition for talent. The most precious commodity in the world today is not oil and it's not water, it's talent. And talent comes in all shapes and sizes and all ethnicities. And no nation that pushes people away or sends a message or no commonwealth that sends a message that people aren't welcome will win in the talent race. You know, I was struck just over the last few months and, you know, in the, in the senatorial campaign, an issue came up about our welcome, you know, to folks. In, the, in this case, a University of Virginia student who was a Virginian, a native Virginian, but of Indian origin, our welcome to him. This debate about the slavery um, uh, resolution in the, uh, in the floor of the General Assembly, the, some of the comments that have been made about a recently elected member of Congress who wanted to use Thomas Jefferson's Quran to take the oath of office. When we send out a message that we're not welcome to all, we're not just selling out on some really important values that are Virginia values. We're also sending a message to the world that, gosh, if we want to do business in North America, and, vo and most do, then we ought to look for another place, a place where we'll be more welcome. I spend a lot of time trying to get international businesses to come to Virginia, and I've had some success, but I groan every time I see one of these instances that might suggest to the world that we're not a welcoming commonwealth. And so this is something, again, that you can be uniquely situated as lawyers to do. And I would just say one way to do it, one way that Ann and I have found to do it that really is, it's, it's, there are many opportunities to do it. Ask yourself this question. Am I in any major part of my life in a minority, in a racial minority? And if your answer is no, then find a part of your life where everybody isn't like you, a church, a civic organization, a neighborhood, a workplace, and get deeply involved in that place over a long period of time and try to be, try to learn and try to be a bridge builder and try to be a reconciler. I had the great fortune of serving as mayor of a city that was 65% African American. I learned an awful lot along the way that I didn't know before. We've had the experience in supporting our kids in the public schools in Richmond of being in a lot of classrooms where we were in, in a minority and learned what it was like to some small degree for the thousands and hundreds of thousands of millions of people who have been in minority situations in virtually their entire life, it's an important thing to learn. And it gives you the ability to try to build bridges. And so that would be my fourth recommendation to you if you want to build a public service career. That's still so needed. I see it every day in this commonwealth and in this nation. And, and the fifth, I just can't get away with without saying this, hey, run for office. Um, <laughs> You know, one of the things, I, I'm an optimist by nature, um, a very optimistic person. My mother told me, you know, if you want to be right, be a pessimist. But if you want to do right, be an optimist. And I decided I would rather do right than be right, so I'm an optimist. Um, but every once in a while, I do get slightly pessimistic uh, or, or down about our prospects in the future. And the two things that make me feel down a little bit as I look 25 or 50 years down the road in our country are these declining voting participation rates. You know, when Ann's dad was elected governor in 1969, 65% of registered Virginia voters voted in that election. When I was elected governor in 2005, 45% of registered Virginia voters voted in, in my election. So what's it going to be 20 years from now? I mean, if it's 25 or 30% 20 years from now, 
I, I posit that we will have to come up with a new word to describe our form of government because the word democracy will not apply really.